Uh, and I want to welcome our first set of speakers, um, Tom Sokolsky and Jenny Ann. Uh oh. I think McCowan. McCowan. <laughs> I got the hard name in the uh, And they are going to talk to us about their um, art project called The Encampment. And it's, I, I'm not going to try to describe it because um, it's so intricate and involved and very interesting, and they will do a much better job. Um, after the, we have the presentation, we will be doing our annual general meeting, and we have sandwiches and uh, treats and things as well for a little reception. And then tomorrow, of course, we reconvene down at Fort York at around 8.30, 8.30. Um, yeah, 8.30, not 8. <laughs> uh, and we have a full day planned as well there. And we may run into them again down there because they're going to be doing some work down at Fort York tomorrow. So, on that note, I'll turn it over to you. So, um, hi everyone, how are you doing? <coughs> We've been doing a lot of presentations lately. Uh, just so that you know, when we do um, when we do our work, we we work with public participants, and uh, so we go out and we do, we recruit people to build our artwork with us, and that's the first thing that we've been doing, and we've been doing that since more or less the middle of January. Um, to start the evening off, though, we just thought we there's a little two minute video that I created um, that is on the Luminato. Uh, site, uh, but I thought you would might like to see it. It's only two minutes long, but it gives you a really clear overview, and then we'll go into a PowerPoint that goes into a little bit more detail about what we're doing. So I'll just put this on, and as soon as I have my glasses, <laughs> you got it. idea very briefly that gives you um, a little look at what what we do and we have a little um, so <clears throat> Jenny and I um, Jenny and I met in um, 2006 and I was uh, basically come, coming from the opera and theater world. For those of you who may know music, I spent about 10 years working with R. Murray Schaefer and directed a lot of his operas, uh, the Science Center, Union Station, uh, pretty much all over North America and in Europe, and then uh, lots of theater and other things. And I suddenly decided that I would move out of that world and go more into visual arts because I, that's what I was doing. 
uh, ultimately. And um, and that year, 2006, the year before I did work with the Toronto International Art Fair, curating for them. And then I had to work in Ottawa. And then in 2006, we had a I had a commission from the Falls View Casino to create kind of a circus thing around all their fountains. And I needed a choreographer. And I was. <laughs> I'm not a circus guy, but um, so we were. Um, I was out one evening at a friend's gallery, and there was an event going on. And 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 I uh, said, "What's going on?" And he said, "Well, there's this woman who's put together this event, and uh, she's working in a strange and unusual way. But a friend of hers fell from silks and became a paraplegic, and so they were raising money for one of those wheelchairs. Uh, you know, the motorized one. We know more about it, but." Um, Anyway, it was her, and uh, then we started working together, and she choreographed the work at Falls View, and then this uh, commission came from the first Nuit Blanche in 2006, and that's when we were commissioned at that point to think of something around mental health, the history of mental health on Queen Street West. So I proposed the idea of a metaphorical archaeological dig. And that particular idea has stuck with the encampment when we did it in Toronto, when we did it in New York, when we did it in Ottawa, and now we've returned to Toronto to do the bicentennial, the, the civilian history of the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so we have a particular way of working um, when we do our work. As I was mentioning to you at the beginning, um, we create a work Jenny and I create big works, and we just can't do them alone. And to a certain degree, we, we kind of have, we're a bit of a throwback to the Renaissance period of time where you would have a guild, and you would have a great amount of people coming together, exchanging their skills, a little bit like caravana works. That's like a guild. You know how everyone comes together, and they were making, helping each other, making costumes and stuff like that? Same idea. Um, so we figured, well, how are we going to do this? And we... We have a philosophy about engagement with people that we just thought we would make a call and see what would happen. The first time we did it, um, you want to talk about that, a little bit about all of that? Yeah, sure. So I guess what Tom's talking about, the public participation aspect, is really how we came together based on that project. The project that I did with a bunch of circus performers, although I'm not a circus performer, although I've been hired by the circus a few times. Um, was a project where I first experimented with making works that are public and totally opening it up and taking a risk and kind of bringing people together, setting up a structure, letting people take initiative to do what they wanted to do, and then just kind of organizing it and forming it, forming it into something. And so that's what I did in this gallery with circus performers, dancers, visual artists, installation artists, <coughs> drummers, and other musicians and DJs and lighting designers. There ended up being about 50 people participating at any given time. And so this was this kind of structure that began. And it started out small, but what I learned is that there was a really big momentum when you give, when you open up creative opportunities for people and people decide they want to join in, then there starts to be a real excitement because you can really build a connection and really build momentum when you start to put people who want to take action and want to learn things and want to do things in the same room. So this is kind of this... Uh, idea that we've been working with in the artworks in terms of public participation and engagement. So, as we mentioned earlier, <clears throat> for 2012, we're going to be doing a dig, an arch a metaphorical <clears throat> dig into the civilian history of the War of 1812. So, every collaborator researches and selects a story. Jenny, um, we, we kind of split our studio. I take care of, at this point, um, I'm taking care of a lot of the conceptual work, uh, doing the renderings and all of that kind of thing, and then Jenny works on the body or the content of the work. So the, the, that, those big tent formations that you saw in uh, the little video, a lot of that is, is my work. I'm kind of work, you know, kind of get into how the tents are going to look, how the lights are going to work, and then Jenny will explore the stories in the, in the first year we, we met a wonderful man, and we used a book called Remembrance of Patients Past, which explored the history of in, uh, mental, health. mental health between 1870 and 1940 before the use of chemical treatment. 
Um, and then when we worked in New York, we looked at the history of quarantine, because that island where you saw uh, is uh, called Roosevelt Island, and that was an island that up until 1975 no one lived. It was only used for quarantine. So during the Spanish influenza, during tuberculosis, if you had any kind of viral symptoms, you were shipped over to the island and you were quarantined there. People coming in from Ellis Island, if there was something contagion, they would go from Ellis Island over to Roosevelt Island. And that history we did probably, well, we did around 18, early 1800s to about 1940. It was, yeah, more like 1850. 1850. And then in 2008, we were engaged to work on the history of intellectual disability. Um, so, is someone wanting to come in? Yeah. Yes, please come in. Have a seat. There's a seat right there. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, and so, in 2008, we worked in, uh, we did a work that looked at the history of intellectual disability. We worked with Community Living and the, the National Capital Commission. What was interesting about that particular work is that rather than bringing everybody, all the public participants, who we then call creative collaborators, into one area, we went across the country looking at seven different uh, regions and working with individuals with intellectual disability, their kind of companions, and the history within those selected areas. And then we brought it all together to Ottawa and put it in Major Hills Park. And now the same idea is that the histories that we're looking at are not the military histories. It's not about the guns, it's not about the cannons, it's not about any of that. It's about the women, it's about the children, it's about the people who didn't fight, it's about the grocery stores, it's about who was selling food to someone they shouldn't have been selling food to. <laughs> it was about seduction, it was about the things that happen during war when there's betrayal, when there's an American officer who is there and he's flirting with a loyalist and the tensions that are created in family. Because anything, any country that goes under occupation or an invasion experiences the same thing. And that's what's actually wonderful about what we're looking at because the people we have who are creative collaborators are not just loyalists, they're not that generation. It's mixed, it's black, it's Indian, it's uh, Caribbean. We have a diverse array of people who are all very interested in the history of Toronto because they are now part of what is shaping the future of that history. So there's a real eagerness and a willingness on everyone's part to look at what our history is. For example, no one knew that there was a Jewish community in Toronto in 1812. And it was very small, but they were the colonels the, and the lieutenants in the militia. There was also the remaining French community, which was here first. And uh, the Babi family, I believe, or the it's a Babi family, and they were very wealthy merchants, and they supplied all the uniforms to the militia. There was also the blacks who were here as a result of the underground railway that was coming up from Niagara Falls. And I just read an interesting story because of the British fronts all over the world, because it was a huge imperialistic force at that time, and they were fighting major wars. If you were on the side of Britain, as a soldier, you could move to a different front. So it turns out, and they're still proving this, that there was, there, I, they know now that there was a squad of Prussians who were working, there was a squad of Swiss, and there was a squad of Ukrainians who were working here during the War of 1812. They were stationed down at Fort George. So we're finding out all these histories. Mm -hmm. And maybe, Jenny, you can tell everyone how you kind of put the story back together and how that functions with, with oh, sure. So what we did, because it's such a big history, and in the past we've let people research on, the, on their own, but because it's such a big history and such a big project, and because we wanted each tent to really represent the life of an individual, what we did is do a big search of names. So we've been trying to pull names from all kind of different themes and areas and create what we could build as like what would be the most sorry, like the most kind of accurate picture of what life might have been like in this area, not just Toronto, but kind of extending across. So that we, exactly what we did was just a dig, looking down through all the names, pulling up as many names as we could out of different books, compiled a list of about over 500 names anyway, and then went in searching of archival material. Every 
story that's going to be in the encampment is linked to some kind of archival resource. So people can take the name of an individual and then know that it's rooted in something that's real and proven to be historically accurate, but then do all their research to find the context and build the context to kind of color their artistic expression of what that person's life might be. So we have a story bank. There's over 200 stories, and the collaborators are in there reading and choosing and selecting, and they're choosing them based on ones that they're interested in, that they connect with, maybe they find something similar, because what happens in a lot of the stories is they really resonate with life today. You can almost see yourself in some of these people. So people are choosing them for different reasons. Of course, some people are just choosing famous people. The typical ones. <laughs> Laura C. Gordway today. I was like, oh. <laughs> but there were, there were a lot of very, uh, there's a Diane Gray's book, um, the alarms. In the midst of alarms. In the midst of alarms. Yeah. It's a brilliant book because she covers the energy of women all across North America, not only Canadians, but also Americans, and the women who were moving between both countries because some families were split as a result of the end of the Revolutionary War. Not only in the Loyalists and that, but also in the First Nations community. A lot of the First Nations remained in the United States. A lot of them left the United States. And as you know, during the War of 1812, they were fighting each other. That's why I think Alan Taylor's book, The Civil War of 1812, was more appropriate because actually it was a civil war. The North, Canada, who was filled at that point, Upper Canada, 90% of them were loyalists, were fighting to actually retain this country as their own and be loyal.